very pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's panel on the future of the spiritual but not religious, which is part of a three-day conference we're holding here at the center, generously co-sponsored by the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. A special welcome to those of you who might be joining us from the Alumni Council, the Dean's Council, or the Dean's Leadership Forum. Um, if anyone's looking for seats, there's two seats up front um, that are open, and maybe one here, there are st and one there. So there's plenty of seats still over. Don't, be, don't feel shy. Just no one take my seat, please. <laughs> I will need to sit down at one point. Um, I should say a special thanks to, um, to the folks at Essel, and especially Jeff Kripal um, and Mike Murphy and Bill Parsons for helping make this conference a reality. If this is your first time to the center, um, please have a look around. And if you have any questions, please ask me or any uh, one of the staff who I'll short, shortly introduce. Uh, you can also find brochures out in our lobby if you're interested in uh, our programming. Now, speaking of the staff, um, I owe them all a great deal of thanks for their help in organizing this panel and the conference of which it is a part. And I wish to thank them um, in turn. Uh, first of all, I'd like to Thank Corey O'Brien, Associate Director in the corner, um, Ariel Ruth Goldberg in the back. Thank you so much for all your work. Um, Dory, I believe, has stepped out, Dory. but Dory's out. <laughs> There's Dory. Dory and Matthew Whitaker, who I don't believe is in the room either, but uh, these four have been uh, absolutely instrumental in pulling off uh, today and this whole weekend, so thank you all. Um, before I say more about our topic this afternoon and introduce our panelists, I'd like to uh, remind you to please silence your cell phones. Uh, thank you. So I count it among the great pleasures and privileges of my scholarly life to have been included in a series of conferences in recent years hosted by the Center for Theory and Research at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. Um, my friend and colleague, Greg Shaw, over here to my right, was the first to invite me to one of those week-long conferences back in 2015, where I met um, Mike Murphy and Jeff Kripal, and whose conjoined genius uh, is what leads the programming at Esalen. Um, I mention that because a conference on the spiritual but not religious movement, or the SBNR movement, as I've come to learn, uh, the acronym, that there was a conference scheduled to take place at Esalen last February, led by Bill Parsons and Jeff Kripal. But Mother Nature had other plans. Uh, you may have recalled that mudslides um, in Big Sur downed roads and bridges all along the coastal highway, which crippled Esalen, cut it off from, I think, both the north and the south. And the SBNR conference was canceled, and in fact, Esalen was closed for six months. That was in February, and sometime in March, I learned that I was to become the, the next director here at the center. And in light of all that Esalen had done for me in recent years, it seemed only right to repay the favor by offering to host this conference here, albeit a year later. Sadly, not everyone from the original conference uh, was able to make it this weekend. And that probably has something to do with the fact that we don't have quite the same uh, vista of the Pacific Ocean, and there are no hot springs anywhere in the um, center's uh, grounds, though we, you know, we, we are accepting donations uh, if anyone would like to fund the CSWR hot baths. Um, but we have been able to, I, I mean, it might be tough, tough to get by the dean, uh, but let's see. Uh, other scholars, though, have been able to join us, and I'm very grateful for the new additions, uh, despite the fact that they have to suffer through these relative hardships. So I'm going to leave it to our three panelists to explain exactly what SBNR is and why assessing its future is so important. But I want to say um, that the conference fits perfectly with one of the center's five new programming threads, namely what we're calling the future of the study of religion. So with this new thread, we're hoping to explore both how the history of religions is evolving in and around us already and how we as scholars must evolve with it, must cultivate senses and sensibilities attuned to these new religious forms and expressions, and must find new ways, new means of interpretation 
if we are to remain rigorous and relevant. So let me now introduce our three panelists. <clears throat> Jeff Kripal holds the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University and is the Associate Director, as I said, of the Center for, this, uh, Center for Theory and Research at the Esalen Institute. He's the author of numerous books, including his most recent, Secret Body, Erotic and Esoteric Currents in the History of Religions from Chicago. He specializes in the comparative study of uh, extreme religious states from the ancient world to today. Bob Fuller is professor of religious studies at Bradley University. Professor Fuller came to Bradley from the University of Chicago where he received his PhD in the fields of religious psychological uh, religion and psychological studies and American religion. Professor Fuller's research concerns the relationship between psychology and religion as well as the study of contemporary religion in the United States. He's the author of no less than 13 books, including, uh, most relevant for today, Spiritual But Not Religious, Understanding Unchurched America. And finally, Linda Mercadante is the Straker Senior Professor of Historical Theology at the Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Her research centers on questions of how religious beliefs are embedded in culture. Her current research focuses on the SBNRs, challenging stereotypes of them and finding a coherence in the spiritual belief narrative of the hundreds she's interviewed. Her book, Belief Without Borders, Inside the Minds of the Spiritual But Not Religious, has been featured by NBC's The Today Show, New York Times, and others. So the, this is how these uh, panels will work. I'll invite each of our panelists up to speak. Uh, and then after we've heard from them, uh, they will bring their three chairs up. They'll face you. I'll stand here and take questions, um, and which they will answer, <laughs> uh, I hope, because uh, certainly I can. Um, but uh, we, we're, we're hoping to have plenty of time for questions and discussion, so please do stick around. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming our three panelists. I'm going to pass these books around if anyone's interested, but I would like them back, please. So. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. So I'm Jeff. Um, I've got three hats on, even if you can't see them. Um, first of all, I'm a historian of religion, so I'm really interested in the SBNR as a kind of modern religious movement with its own complexities and its own histories. Um, I do direct or co-direct the Center for the Theory and Research at Esalen, which is an SBNR community, no question about it. Um, I so wanted us to meet there. Uh, not because of the hot baths, um, but because I wanted the community and its leadership there to hear what these scholars had to say about the history and nuances and possible future of that movement. But that didn't happen. So I was thrilled when Charlie called and took it up here. And finally, I, I have the hat on as a teacher uh, who, whose job it is to teach young people uh, 18 to 23, more or less, but also a number of PhD students, many of whom would self-identify here as well. So I'm, I'm very, I'm not just interested in this intellectually, I'm concerned about it pedagogically, uh, and I'm involved with it institutionally. So I got a lot of hats on, and my comments might be a bit scattered, but I think they'll, they'll come together if, if you just keep those three things in mind. The first thing I want to say um, is, is, is a bit historical. To Charlie's question, why, why SBNR? Why is this important? Um, the first thing I would say is that the SBNR was partially created by the comparative study of religion. There, there is an intimate historical and conceptual relationship between comparison itself as a, as a cognitive and um, intellectual act and the spiritual but not religious position. That, that's not always recognized, but, but it is in fact the case. The comparative study of religion is stranger than you think. 
Um, most of the received uh, fathers and mothers of the field had very interesting and often eccentric personal mystical lives. And I think a fuller history would, would reveal that. I'm just going to talk about four of them here, just real briefly to give you a sense of this. But Max Mueller, for example, often called the father of the comparative study of religion, um, really ended his life writing autobiographically about his own mystical humanism, which was really a kind of fusion of Christian theology and, and uh, the Hindu Upanishads. Uh, William James, we all read, we, 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 William James is a local figure here I recognize. Um, we all read the varieties of religious experience in graduate school, and many of us have read it as well in other contexts. But I know when I read the book at Chicago in the 1980s, no one ever told us that William James was involved in psychical research for his, pretty much his entire adult life. He spent as much time sitting with mediums and psychics as he did uh, probably in the classroom. And that's a whole part of the Jamesian legacy that, that just gets it's lopped off. Uh, Mircea Eliade, someone who founded the discipline I was trained in in Chicago, uh, his last novel, Youth Without Youth, is essentially a, a piece of uh, eso esoteric fiction in which he really kind of plays his cards uh, my, my own mentor, Wendy Doniger, has always argued that that's his most autobiographical novel. It's about a scholar of comparative religion who is going to commit suicide on Easter Day, and he walks across the street and gets struck by lightning. Uh, and as he heals in the hospital, he grows younger uh, and develops all kinds of paranormal abilities, including uh, the ability to dream the next day. Houston Smith, um, a, a paragon of comparison, quite radical in the 1960s uh, and 70s, but of course psychedelics were a very important part of his theorizing and his life. We all know that, but we just sort of forget that when we think about the comparative study of religion. Um, so these are just a few examples. The way the story of the comparative study of religion is usually told is that it finds its origins in 19th century uh, British colonialism and missionary activity, and it's somehow inherently uh, uh, hegemonic and colonizing. Um, that's part of the story, and we need to struggle with that. But the truth is, is that in the 20th century, the real origins of the comparative study of religion lie in the counterculture. Uh, they lie in, in the 1960s, when most of these programs were, were funded and founded, and where many of the professors emerged from that counterculture after taking something like LSD or something and, and realizing that there's, there's more to the human being than, than this. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the second thing I want to say is that there are different forms of the spiritual but not religious orientation. Some of them very, some of them emerging from extreme or robust uh, mystical experiences give you an example in a moment. And most of them, I think, emerging from a deep moral sensibility um, and not requiring any kind of unusual or extraordinary experience. The first case, I spent the last two and a half years working with uh, a woman from Houston named Elizabeth Crone. Uh, in 1988, she was attending the first year anniversary of her grandfather's death at her local Reformed Jewish synagogue. Uh, which happens to be right across the street from my own university. Uh, she stepped out of the car with her two-year-old boy in her hand, and she was struck by lightning. Uh, she then had an elaborate uh, uh, near-death experience, and as she was healing, she developed paranormal powers, uh, including the ability to dream what was going to happen in the next day, next day's news. Um, I handed her Eliade's Youth Without Youth, and told her that she should read this. Uh, and she gave it back to me uh, after reading it and says, that's, that's not fiction. Um, so now what's interesting about Elizabeth, though, is before the lightning strike, entirely secular, mocked all religious or spiritual or new age sensibilities. Her first experience after getting struck by lightning and standing over her body in the 
wet parking lot was a sense of how wrong she had been uh, to, to judge those people. Um, and she herself describes herself as spiritual but not religious now. The, the near-death experience made her less religious but more spiritual, and she has her own way of expressing that. So that's a, that's a kind of extreme event, a kind of rev, rev, revelation, as it were. I think that's the exception. I think in the classroom and among younger people, the spiritual but not religious is simply a placeholder. It doesn't name anything specific for them, although they have their own beliefs and their own convictions. It's primarily a form of moral protest. They are horrified and disgusted with the way religious voices in the public have essentially promoted a kind of hatred of their own friends and their own peers. And they simply want nothing to do with that. Um, for better or for worse, they, those are the voices they hear in the public. They're not aware of the more nuanced and the more sophisticated voices. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, that I think we work with in the classroom. The question that I have as a professor of religion at a secular university working with these young people is what, what our role is now. What, what can we do in the classroom to help them reassess the religious traditions, get a much better sense of their richness and sophistication, but also better articulate where they're at morally, theologically, existentially. Um, and I think we can, we, we can go a long ways uh, uh, in doing that. And finally, let me say that sometimes the classroom itself can be an extreme and extraordinary place for these young people. Let me go back to Esalen. Uh, Esalen's founding goes back to a comparative religion classroom at Stanford in the early 1950s in which a young man named Michael Murphy was thought he was in a social psychology class but he mistakenly walked into Frederick Spiegelberg's comparative religion class. Spiegelberg was a, a German comparativist who was friends with Martin Heidegger and Paul Tillich, and who had had a mystical experience in a wheat field in 1917 and developed a notion he called the religion of no religion, which was essentially a mystical theology that um, resisted the exclusive truth of any single tradition, but insisted on the divine presence in the natural world and, and in all of humanity. And it was really that uh, mystical theology that Mike um, um, imbibed as a, young, as a young college student and then went on to, to help found Esalen and, and the human potential movement. So the, we do have effects sometimes. They are listening. Uh, and it does matter what we say. And uh, so I, th I think I'll just leave it at that. I'm Bob Fuller. I, too, am a professor of religious studies at a secular university, a private secular university. Um, first of all, I did take the announced topic today, the future of the spiritual but not religious movement, uh, serious for the kind of remarks that I had planned to give. But let me remind you that when we get to question and answer, if you have some questions, these, the, the whole phrase, spiritual but not religious, we're here for a conference where we're very painfully aware in many, many ways those are, words mean the same thing. At the end of the day, what is the highest reality to which I should adapt myself? And whether we use the word spiritual or religious, as opposed to economics or politics or social realities, et cetera, whether we use the word religion or spirituality, it's about sensing that there is a reality that transcends the sensory experience to which, in my life, I ought to harmoniously adapt myself there too. And the words mean the same in that sense. But we do know that over the last three or four decades, it has become more and more common practice in the United States 
to use the word spiritual to mean something individual, more subjective, based on my own experiences. And we've come to use the word religion to be more affiliation with a congregation, with a longer standing tradition. And here in the United States, it would be predominantly Christianity, to a little lesser extent Judaism. And so we think of religion as more institutional expressions, but the words ultimately mean the same thing. So arbitrarily coming up with this, I consider myself spiritual but not religious, is a little bit of an artifact. And we know it, it, it doesn't hold up if you ask good questions about uh, that phrase. I've spent much of my career examining what I call unchurched American religion. And um, <laughs> One of the things that I discovered is that it has a long tradition in the United States. Even if we go back to the settling of the United States, the earliest colonists here um, looked for God in many places, not just the, the revealed scripture, but they also looked in nature. Jonathan Edwards, the fire and brimstone Puritan minister, was at heart a mystic, and he had a pantheism. He saw a divine presence everywhere. And by the time we get a couple generations later, Ralph Waldo Emerson abandons his pulpit to become a spokesperson for transcendentalism. Now, don't mistake it. He wasn't a secularist. He believed in a transcendental reality. But he believed you can find it in many places out in the world, and we have to open ourselves radically to experiences that we might get glimpses of that more. Another generation later, Later, William James is writing the varieties of religious experience, but he's saying the same. He was convinced there is a more, a more of our sensory experience, but he looked many places to find it, what he even called empirical evidence of that more. So we find throughout highbrow and lowbrow American culture a long, rich history. What it tends to share is this. People interested in the spiritual but not religious will see are probably not as motivated to religion by a sense of sin. They kind of reject that and fear and guilt as the prime motivations. They're also not primarily interested in religion for procuring an afterlife. They're more interested in a rich, vibrant, abundant this life and what a connection with the more might mean about that. So they don't always buy all the categories that we think of. But I came here today to try to say also, what is the future of this? We know it's gaining. I don't know if you've noticed that when the Pew Research Center or Gallup polls ask people to self-identify, they're now giving them three categories. My students only fill out forms probably that give them these three categories. You can identify as non-religious, none. You can identify as religious with affiliation with a existing tradition, a congregation. I'll for the moment call that conventionally religious. Or they're using the phrase spiritual but not religious. And increasingly, Americans are being, if nothing else, forced to self-identify in one of those three categories. Not that any of us are pretty comfortable. One of us, like, kind of say a crossover or two of them or, or something. But um, it, it's becoming. So we know now that it's probably at least 20% of the adult U.S. population might feel comfortable using that phrase as long as they can adjust it a little bit for their own particular circumstance. Among younger individuals, it could be as high as 25 or 30% of the millennial generation. So we know it's got a, a, a lot of traction in American culture. The question is, what is its future? And I am going to speak to that. Now, when I look at any topic, I probably am different than most humanities professors and religious studies scholars in one thing. I don't always look to the environment and to society, historical, and cultural trends. I believe we also need to keep in mind we are a biological organism. You and I are part, we have genetically evolved mechanisms, just like squirrels, robins, and tadpoles, <laughs> all come into this universe uh, with biologically evolved mechanisms that structure many aspects of the way we think, feel, and behave. And I don't want to lose sight of that when I talk about this. But the one caveat, asking me to predict the future of something in religion is probably a waste of time. I began my teaching career at Bradley University 40 years ago, telling students, well, you will be, live in the generation where we will still have Catholicism in America, but it won't be Roman Catholicism. The United States Catholic Church will, will disassociate from Rome, and I gave reasons of divorce issues and women, clergy, et cetera, and went on and on with all my reasons. Well, you saw how well that prediction worked out. <laughs> Want to know how my prediction for the 2016 pre presidential election went? Not so well. 
Um, so asking me to predict uh, this is probably uh, an exercise in futility. But with that, I definitely do see the spiritual but not religious movement, which again is somewhere over 20 or higher percent of the U.S. population solidifying and possibly making slight more uh, growth and inroads into what I might call the American spiritual marketplace in the near future. My reasons for that are one, based in the biological, the nature part of the nature nurture part. The human organism is incurably religious. I call us homo religiosus. Um, the propensity towards religiosity is deep within us, if for no other reason, we are the one species that can cognitively ask questions of ultimate causality. We can ask, why are we here? Why did I wake? Why does every human being wake up in the morning and find themselves in a universe, in a universe that finite creatures did not create? And at the end of the day, what do I want to have done with my life? We, we can ask those questions. And even if we're vexed at our inability to sometimes answer them as convincingly and once and for all as we would hope, we ask and are even haunted sometimes by those questions. I don't think, if part of it is, will there be a progressive movement towards non-religiosity, non-spirituality, and to become wholly secular? I don't think so. And my reason is, once again, anchored less in cultural, environmental, historical kinds of categories than what I call our genetically evolved um, beinghood. And I think that um, homo sapiens will continue to be homo religiosus. And so I do believe there will be a, a vibrant religiosity uh, in American culture for long into the future. I also want to point out that when we look today, and it, it's easy to caricature people drawn to, if you want to call it new age religiosity, various forms of being spiritual, uh, but not aligned with a more long-lasting congregation and religious tradition, we tend to think that this is new or abnormal. But can I at least for a moment propose to you that it is normal, that we should expect this kind of freelance spirituality uh, to be, it, some of us just presuppose that the normal thing is to belong to a long-standing uh, religious denomination of some kind. And maybe it's not. I ask you just to quick think about your music sensibilities. You don't really expect people to belong to a Beethoven society, where every Sunday morning from 11 to 12, one says creeds about Beethoven being the one and only best uh, composer, and that we will shun other composers, etc. like this. You expect a little more variety in people's music. You don't expect them to be um, singly focused in their musical sensibilities. Same with artistic sensibility. And I would propose with spiritual and religious sensibilities, some form of eclecticism probably is more normal. And with this, I want to say why I think that will be normal for a short time to come. There, we do live, compared to other generations of humans, with less material insecurity, or put differently, with some more material security. I might propose to you that, in part, the spiritual but not religious expressions are expressions of a form of spirituality less driven by material insecurity. Secondly, I might also suggest that it's where we have more choice and we have weaker cultural constraints upon us. If you were born in medieval France, perhaps you would have been the village atheist. But it would have been Roman Catholicism that you were the atheist about. It wouldn't have been Buddhism, Islam. It wouldn't have been um, Protestant. What century did I put this in? Let's put it 14th century so we can safely say you wouldn't have been Protestant Christianity. Um, you were under cultural constraints about what traditions you could um, be bound by, et cetera. So we have much fewer of that in our mobile pluralistic society. I think what we're seeing is what you would expect to see in spirituality less driven by material insecurity and with greater uh, freedom from cultural constraints. Um, also, of course, I mentioned pluralism. In our age of internet connectedness, and all of us have some much more level of a global awareness. We've seen things posted from other countries, other cultures. Uh, we're aware of the relativism of any one tradition, maybe more so than in other uh, times. And so once again, this frees us from cultural constraints. We think of the word heretic, right? But one of the root meanings of the word heresis is to choose. We live in an era where you not only can choose in religion, you really must choose. You really must choose. And we do have 
three broad categories into which to choose. I can become wholly non-religious, and I can see my life through wholly secular, I'll, I'll call it for the um, clearly scientific materialism, I've kind of made a straw man out of that argument, but I, we'll, we'll let it go. Secondly, I can adhere to a long-lasting religious tradition. Or three, I can explore. And I think in our age, expecting what we see in the spiritual but not religious, again, it's not only going to solidify, it will probably, at least in the near future, continue to expand. But now, <laughs> I want to move to one other side. And this is where I'm going to put some qualifications on why I don't think that it will um, ever like totally dominate, or we're going to see other forms of religiosity. Can I remind us this one little background uh, to all this? The world population is growing rapidly. And in places we don't often think about or talk about, but the places on planet Earth that are, have the fastest gro population growth are places that are very religious, very conservatively religious, and of a religion that uh, we may not be real comfortable with. It tends to be tribal. It tends to be in-group versus out-group. It tends to be very strict and rigid. And I just see this also as something on planet Earth. If we look across both hemispheres and across all continents, uh, the spiritual but not religious that we see in parts of Western Europe and in the United States don't, aren't going to um, in any way eclipse that kind of a future uh, for religion on Earth. But I want to also say that part of our genetically evolved systems is when we're confronted with limited resources, when there's fear, when there's threat, can I just even use the word stress? It elicits behavior, feelings, and thoughts in us that are very different when we're freed from those threats, that stress. And could I say that the appeal to powerful authority and to wanting and feeling more secure when there is powerful authority is much greater in periods of stress and threat and problems of material security. Secondly, in those times, there is much more sense of need for tribal solidarity and determining who is the in-group, who is the out-group. And throughout human history, one way we know who's in-group is whether they profess the exact same religious beliefs we do, because they must have willed themselves to do this. And, with, and publicly professing that is what they called in, in kind of physical anthropology and cultural anthropology costly displays of group membership uh, because you must will yourself to profess those. There will be much more concern with that and also much more concern with strictness and behavior and conformity to the group. With those there, some of the kinds of open, eclectic tolerance of all forms of doctrine that we see expressed won't flourish in those kinds of environments. So I think I want to just make sure that as I, pa I pause and let now Linda to come and, and add uh, additional comments to the future of the spiritual but not religious movement, there are some variables at stake. And where we see more pluralism possible, where we see more material um, security, and where we see more ability to interconnect with cosmopolitan world outlooks, we'll see the spiritual but not religious movement continue to thrive. But in cultural and social environments where that's not the case, I would rather suspect we'll see something very diametrically um, opposite as the expression of religion. Very much for coming. Uh, it's great to see you here, and um, I thank my previous speakers. So um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Uh, salad bar spiritualists, narcissistic commitment phobes, anti dogma experience seekers, victims of religious abuse, <clears throat> rich white women in expensive yoga outfits. <laughs> These are some of the stereotypes that I'm sure we've all heard. Uh, about those non-religious nuns who self-identify as spiritual but not religious. Now, having been an SBNR myself, I have long felt these hyperbolic labels do an injustice to the thoughtful, determined, spiritual questers that SBNRs often can be. To dispel the stereotypes, SBNRs need to speak in their own voices to be heard. And they deserve our attention. I, I think that's obvious here, <clears throat> because they're rapidly contributing to a profound change in the spiritual narrative of the US. 
Now, so far, as you may know, it's largely quantitative and statistical analysis. I mean, until recently, that was mostly, those have mostly been the dominant tools that are used to study them. But the various researchers do agree on some core insights, that the SBNRs have an anti-institutional bent, that they have differences in commitment styles, that there's increasing individualism among this group, that it's somewhat secularizing, and that other f features in them reflect a globalized postmodern world. <clears throat> However, the one topic that's rarely re looked at or not looked at in depth is belief. And even when it does come up, there's often assumpt an assumption that SBNR beliefs are disorganized, that they're eclectic, with very little agreement across the group. Others specula speculate that the SBNR ethos shows that religious, quote, dogmatism, which is a negative code word for belief, has come to an end. And some scholars, such as Nancy Tatum Ammerman, suggest that the SBNR separation of spirituality from religion is largely a boundary maintaining discourse rather than an actual rejection of behaviors often considered religious. But even in, in her cogent analysis, belief doesn't play a central role except to be identified with religion and rejected by SBNRs as implausible. Now, I agree that the SBNR ethos is a boundary setting activity, totally. Uh, it's a rejection of the sacred secular dichotomy it's a recognition that spirituality infuses everyday life, and it's clearly a, a weakening of the bonds of religion. That's true. I, I agree with it. But when I frequently speak with SBNRs, I hear a lot more than that, and that's what I set out to study. <clears throat> because quantitative analysis really doesn't do a good job probing the nuances of motivation and belief, or n neither does it let genuine voices be heard, I created a qualitative research project consisting of an open-ended, semi-structured interview process. And I spoke in doing this research with hundreds of SBNRs all across uh, North America. Then I analyzed about 100 of these interviews, and that's where that book uh, emerged from. I, I looked at uh, silent gen all sorts of age groups, silent generation all the way to millennials. And the interviewees consisted of men and women. Uh, there was uh, LGBTQ participants, some racial and ethnic diversity and people from both coasts as well as the Midwest and Canada. So I tried to get a sample. I mean, qualitative doesn't have to do representation samples, but I tried for that. Now, what I found was that belief, rather than being ancillary or important, was actually a critical aspect of the SBNR ethos, and it absolutely cannot be taken out of the equation. Now, this boundary-setting rhetoric, which it is, of course, has a purpose beyond, beyond the resacralization of everyday life. Instead, it is one which specifically allows its participants to carve out new theological territory. <clears throat> Charting this new territory is critical because it will inevitably affect all of us, just as the dominant Protestant ethos has affected all of us in, in the U.S. So <clears throat> the, uh, in case you're wondering about the method, there were several parts. Of course, at first I explored their prior religious background or lack of it. That was essential. Then we covered four major themes individually. These themes are transcendence, human nature, community, and afterlife. We cover, everybody covered those with me. Now, I chose these areas because they seem topics upon which most people might speculate, at least those in a Western culture. That is, <clears throat> one, is there a power greater than myself? Two, what does it mean to be human? Three, do we need community to flourish spiritually, or is this essentially a solo effort? <clears throat> and finally, what, if anything, will happen to humans after death? If, at least in a Western context, those are questions people ask. Now, against the uh, stereotype that SBNRs don't care about belief, that they just reject it out of hand, nobody balked at being asked about their beliefs. Instead, the people I encountered were deeply interested in these topics, and they were grateful to be asked their thoughts on them. Many claimed that this was the first opportunity they had ever had to talk about these things. All the interviewees seemed very eager to give their reasons for avoiding or withdrawing from organized religion. And it's highly significant, I think, that, quote, religious distress, in other words, they were hurt by religion, did not emerge as a main motivator. Um, and I, I identify religious distress as being seriously hurt by organized religion in some <coughs> tangible way whether that would be physically, emotionally, or relationally. 
The most important reason <clears throat> that they gave for leaving or avoiding organized religion had no, did not have to do with abuse or politics, as you might think. Instead, it was with belief. Many said they could not support some of the beliefs they identified with organized religion, in particular Christianity. For those previously involved in <clears throat> organized religion, theology was so important to them that when they realized they did not agree with at least one or more official teachings, they felt, quote, honor bound to leave. So it was a matter of integrity that when they found something they didn't agree with, they felt they should leave. So that belief was pretty important to them. Uh, but there was often more than that. Many felt it was more mature to give up their former religious beliefs, such as a belief in a personal God or in heaven, even if they still felt emotionally attached to these beliefs. Some felt guilty or even weak for not being able to successfully clear these beliefs from their minds. Others felt liberated from old ideas and free to pursue their spiritual explorations anywhere they chose. So rather than rejecting belief, interviewees saw the constructing of new theological territory as a crucial part of their spiritual journey. And they, they, it occupied a lot of their time. <clears throat> well, what about belief then in particular? Interviewers were nearly unilateral in rejecting certain positions they identified with organized religion, particularly Christianity. And I'm making no bones about this. It was directed against Christianity. They might not say that, but it was so clear. Um, for example, all of them rejected, quote, exclusivism, in other words, the my way or the highway theology, which declares some people are in, some people are out, et cetera. <clears throat> now, few, uh, very few seemed aware that this is hardly a unilateral position within contemporary Christianity, especially, say, you know, mainstream Protestantism, but it didn't matter to them because they felt that Christianity presented a capricious, an arbitrary, or an inscrutable God, and they thoroughly rejected this God. Now, interviewees went even further with this rejection. They didn't simply posit a loving, accepting, or fair God, or perhaps a more feminine God, soft God, or motherly God. <clears throat> Only a few were aware that for decades, within progressive elements of Christianity, there has been a movement to depatriarchalize God, uh, God images. For these espionars, simply putting God in a dress was not going to do it, <laughs> period. Instead, they just threw God totally out of the picture. In fact, nearly all the interviewees, this was amazing, nearly all of them hesitated or completely avoided using the word God all the time. They made a point of it. In addition, almost all of them rejected any kind of transcendent deity, even if conceived in non-patriarchal terms. On another note, all rejected the idea of sin. The word itself particularly rankled them. They especially hated the idea of original sin, misinterpreting it as God creating humans bad and then punishing them for it. <laughs> Cor corollary to that, most rejected traditional views on the afterlife, in particular traditional notions of heaven and hell. Now I could go on and on about this, but I won't because we're limited, but let me say what they proposed, okay? It was clear what they rejected, but what did they propose? Um, so, because rejection of certain beliefs was not the whole story. The interviewees also had beliefs which they affirmed and, and which cohered, believe it or not, cohered across the group in very interesting ways. For instance, almost all insisted that they nevertheless, quote, believed in something. For them, this was a type of transcendence, but I called it hor horizontal transcendence, and that's the idea that there is a sacred dimension that's larger than yourself, but, it's, but the horizontal was that they connected it with human nature, human being, the earth, things like that. And even so, and, and on top of that, many affirmed that divinity resided within. And some went so far as to say, I am God. I heard that a lot. <clears throat> and yet, and yet, there's always an and yet in this research because some interviewees found it hard to give up the idea of the, the comforting images of a God who guided and cared personally for them. Now, some handled this by almost personifying the word the universe, making it sound somewhat interactive and benevolent for everyone, <clears throat> but also non-demanding and specific to their own needs and desires. Okay, what ab I'm just giving you the, the highlights here. What about human nature? Well, as for beliefs about human nature, 
And this is striking. The very first thing every single interviewee said when I asked them what does it mean to be human was everyone is born good. 100%. Amazing. Again, this is likely a widespread cultural repudiation of the stereotype of original sin. Most took a therapeutic, psychological, <clears throat> excuse me, or even deterministic approach to human dysfunction and pathology. If someone misbehaved, many suggested it was likely the result of environmental causes, distorted family dynamics, or unhealthy brain chemistry. Yet, there's always a yet, they often counterbalance this, this determinism <clears throat> by claiming that all behavior is freely chosen, Many, which sounds like a contradiction, right? Many resorted to the idea of an impersonal, impersonal and unbendable, quote, karmic process to ensure that wrong actions matter greatly and have consequences. Not only did this <clears throat> dignify individual choice, but it helped them understand all human problems as a learning experience on a spiritual path. In the end, the traditional view of a God who judges and rewards or punishments has been replaced by an anonymous process that ensures beneficial consequences for those who, quote, wake up and pay attention and dire consequences for those who don't. I hope you're getting the theme that there's, a balance, there's balancing going on here and echoes of previous beliefs. Community, what about that? The interviewee's views on community were fairly straightforward. Many had participated from time to time in various sp alternative spiritual communities and often credited teachers, groups, and readings with helping them along the spiritual path. In the end, however, very few made long-lasting commitments to any of this. Instead, they credit the, credited themselves with the ability to see the universal truths or teachings common to all religions and to practice them on their own. They believed they could more safely avoid the unhelpful aspects of religion by keeping their independence. When I asked in the interview what a really functional and healthy spiritual community would look like, because they didn't reject the idea at all, they said it would be one which supported them and their growth, one where everyone was free to believe and practice as they wished, and one which didn't make too many demands. When I asked how they would recognize such a community, if they went looking for one, Many said, quote, everyone would believe as I do. <laughs> what about afterlife? Finally, we got to afterlife. A few believe that mature people should recognize that after death, they would certainly, they would just simply return to earth or become energy. <clears throat> but the majority didn't like that. They didn't leave it there. Many believed strongly in reincarnation. But unlike traditional notions, Eastern notions of reincarnation, however, which posit the possibility that we might regress, rather than just, leave, just progress, for the interviews, interviewees, it was a very American version of reincarnation with endless second chances to get it right. <laughs> the majority did not believe there was a set theological goal or end point for this process. No end point, no nirvana or heaven or final resting place. And so instead, most believed we could endlessly progress and enjoy happier and more successful lives going forward. So what does this movement suggest? It certainly shows the triumph of imminence, a theme that has only grown since the Enlightenment, yet this movement is not simply a large step on the road to secularization. Instead, the interviewees in this study demonstrate an implicit protest against what they see as an arid and secularizing trend in society. I think SBNR is a protest against that as well as a protest against a, a version of Christian theology. They wanna know <clears throat> there is something more than consumerism, status-seeking, and focus on body image promoted by our society. They also implicitly protest against our society's over-reliance on science, both its methods and its seemingly tightly drawn parameters, scientism. Thus, there are, quote, intimations of transcendence in the current culture, especially in the SBNR ethos. We are witnessing, as Charles Taylor says, quote, the, clo the story of closed imminence beginning to come apart, end quote. This is a profound theological reorientation which will have important effects on our culture. Now, okay, as far as the future part, again, I'm not a prophet and, you know, we could all be wrong, but here's some ideas. This reor reorientation could go in several different directions. On one hand, it could be a draining out of the dregs of traditional religion. 
Even if everyday life takes on increasing spiritual significance, this may not coalesce into a new religiosity a cult or a culture-wide acceptance of one dominant spirituality or a renewal of formal affiliation. All those things many people would hope for, but it wouldn't have to go that way. Because after all, the Pew Forum recently noted that the longer, quote, nuns stay away from organized religious practices, the less spiritual they become. And Ammerman notes that the, that the ones who are the most, quote, spiritual turn out to be religious practitioners. That's what Ammerman says. However, I don't really expect that current forms of religion can be re-energized by the SBNR movement or even as a counterbalance to it, unless there are significant and dramatic changes in organized religion, of course. On the other hand, none of that might be the whole story. The movement instead could be the harbinger of something spiritually new. Now, I doubt it will, it will look much like anything we have now, for the anti-institutional bent in the SBNR ethos is going to make organization very difficult. In fact, most SBNRs I've met seem unaware that many others reject the same doctrines and promote similar theological themes as they do. In fact, some, when, they, when I tell them this, are disappointed and some are even angry when I tell them how similar they are to so many others. <laughs> While SBNRs might not yet recognize or even welcome the commonalities I've laid out, it is possible that a common vision and some form of organization may become desperately needed in our current climate. In fact, the current political climate may push SBNRs to move beyond limiting their efforts on change to the personal or the lifestyle level. In any case, I think there is reason to find hope in the SBNR movement. Through it, there may be emerging a new way to experience, find, and theologically explain the deep feeling that what you see is not all that you get. Thank you. Okay. Well, there you have it, three very different approaches to the spiritual but not religious <coughs> phenomenon, movement, ethos, what have you. So the floor is open. Questions? Uh, I just am curious about the um, historical basis for the use of the term, because my first encounter with it was on an internet dating site mm -hmm. profile <laughs> questionnaire right. about 20 years ago. Right. And in thinking about what was meant or intended by my answering that question for dating purposes, it seemed to be, can I let everybody know I'm cool and independent right. Right. at the same time as I'm letting everybody know that I'm not a fanatic and yeah, I'm not conservative? Exactly. Right. So at some point, this became not just a self-descriptor, but also a sociological measuring tool. What, what's the context for this? Jeff, you go first. I think Jeff, Jeff you've got to answer, answer first. Do you just, just speak. Yeah, little so, yeah. So, I mean, Bill Parsons, who's in the room here, can speak, speak to the history. It, we can trace it back pretty far, but it seems to be actually AA where it really I comes so. to the fore. Yeah, definitely. Uh, which was itself influenced by William James, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, and Carl, yeah. and Carl yeah. Jung. Um, but with, I think the dating site, it, it's, a, it's a piece of humor, but it's also really important. Um, my daughter actually did her MFA on the effect of the cell phones on millennial dating. And she told me that if you want the most dates, you pick SBNR. <laughs> you know, so that's a really good sign that, you know, we're at a major, major category here for at least young, younger people under the age of 30. This was the group she was looking at. So, and I think you're right. I think you're right about it. I think that's exactly what it signals for, for, for that group of people. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that uh, Bill Parsons and I are tried to do a little bit of historical background on the term. And we could find Bill going back, he's in the back of the room, going back into earlier than the century, we found what a Rotary Club uh, uh, advertised mm -hmm. itself, right? Yeah. Matt found this? Yeah. Matt found it. A, a Rotary Club, at, was the first we could find it described itself as a spiritual but not religious organization. We thought that was unusual. That's going back, what, to about maybe the teens or 20s. We then found in a newspaper article after what the Lusitania had uh, sunk that um, 
they, there was a grave, uh, when I mean that, um, a solemn ceremony that was described as spiritual but not religious for that. So we found that predating Bill W. in the 12-step programs. But his phrase was actually <coughs> spiritual, not religious. He didn't have the word but in there, spiritual, not religious. And clearly that's what injected it into the vocabulary of, of Americans. Mm -hmm. And as I say, starting about 15, 20 years ago, Gallup and Pew Research both started using this phrase and now it's it's pretty much uh, so widely used. I use that all the time when I speak to audiences. I always say, now look, when you're gonna go to the dating site, I'm gonna give you a little piece of advice. And they you know, they <laughs> think it's funny, but what I think is when you're looking to date somebody, you're thinking about, well, what kind of person is this? What kind of character do they have? I'm gonna be spending maybe a lot of time with them. So if you say you're an atheist, people still think that you're not a moral person, but I mean, atheists say we can be good without God, so to ask me and ours. But that's still the stereotype of an atheist. And if you say you're Christian or, you know, some actual religion, they figure you're conservative and then, you know, politically conservative and other ways conservative and maybe oppressive to them. Like if you're a woman and you put your site, you say you're a Christian, you're going to get all these really negative, um, really like uh, people that believe in the subordination of women. So you don't want that. I mean, I wouldn't. Um, for sure. But if you say you're spiritual but not religious, I think you're saying, I'm a good person, but I'm not rigid. And so, um, you know, and then you like put down that you're walking on the beach and you like to have fun and you're all set. <laughs> I, I think another piece here that's worth mentioning is the, the Asian religions piece. Um, SBNR is attracted to Asian religious ideas and beliefs. Uh, this came up with reincarnation. Um, and. I don't recall the exact phrase, but Rabindranath Tagore wrote a book called The Religion of Man somewhere in the 1920s, and he uses a virtually identical phrase already there. So you, you can see this. I, I think as we do more and more historical research, we're going to push those, those, those dates back further yeah. and further. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, for people that belong to a traditional religion and take it serious, there's probably a real moral struggle that people go through because there's a standard that you're probably not meeting. And my sense is that people that belong to the SBR movement, they come in already with these values that are part of the postmodern ethos of uh, diversity, inclusivity, tolerance. But are there any kind of moral struggles that you could probably adhere to to that movement in the sense that might tie into more of a traditional structure? My, um my interviewees did think a lot about their uh, character formation and their, uh, I don't know if they wouldn't use the word morality, but you know, if they're meeting standards and they just are getting the standards from different places. So they're not unconcerned with it. If they're very involved in yoga, we had uh, we had one of our participants very learned in, you know, the popular uses of yoga, and they would have, they would get those standards and try to live by those. So I don't think that they're um, necessarily rejecting standards, but they think that the standards that re organized religion gives them is, is old-fashioned and rigid, like it's against, you know, it's homophobic or all that. So they, they have standards, but they just don't want them to be what they stereotype religion as having. I, I also think there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of unconsciousness in some of the SBNR speak. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you'll hear a lot of kind of, of a naive perennialism that oh, yeah. all, all religions are are basically saying the same thing. And what they don't realize is when you say that, you're actually saying that all the religions are wrong. You know, that there's a, there's a critique there. There's a kind of negative critique of the religions through that kind of language. And they're aware of the positive language around tolerance, but they're not aware of the negative critique of these religious traditions that, of course, people from the religious traditions hear right away. And so I, I I think that's going on here as well. Yeah. One of my interviewees said that um, he was raised very uh, liberally without any religion. He was raised SBNR. And he said the only thing that was wrong in his family was thinking you were right. <laughs> and so a lot of people that are, they are perennialists, they do have those views, that view towards organized religion, that, you know, these li people are very limited, but that I can see what's common about them, and I can see what's good about them all. Which, given that many people are against what they consider self-righteousness in organized religion, it has its own form of self-righteousness. Sean, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, this isn't so much about like, like religious organizations, but whether we can be... Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah, okay, so it's about, I'm curious about people like Max Mueller and similar scholars and the creation of comparative religion. Um, so yeah, we can recognize that these, these traditions under colonial rule, um, in, order, in order to be studied and controlled really the narrative, were constructed and turned into religions, um, in a Western sense at least, right? So to continue using these boxes, these subfields, um, kind of advances this colonial cartography of belief. And I'm wondering if maybe the academy studies religions too prescriptively rather than descriptively. Mm. And yeah. if we were to maybe kind of redraw the boundaries of religion, if we might make more spaces in these boxes for people who would otherwise be labeled as PR, mm -hmm. you know, recognize more of uh, religious creoles in a sense. Mm. Yeah. So, can I speak to that? Please. Yeah, I mean, so we're in the Center for the Study of World Religions, right? And the category of world religions in the 1950s was incredibly radical, incredibly forward-looking, and incredibly liberalizing. Today, I don't think it is. I, I share your critique. I worry, like I teach our introduction to the study of religion class at RISE to 125 to 200 young people every fall. Mm. And I've abandoned the world religions approach. Yeah. And the reason I've abandoned it is it leaves everybody in a box. Mm. The, the, the Hindu students are comfortable in their Hinduism, the Buddhist students in their Buddhism, the Christians in their Christian. Everybody gets to be in a box or a silo and they walk away happy without ever really asking the tough question. And so a few years ago, I, I wrote a textbook called Comparing Religions, in which there are no chapters on any religions. Mm. It's all about the cognitive act of comparing and the existential and religious challenges of that. And it walks the students through ex essentially how to compare. And many of my case studies are actually scientists and engineers who had some kind of mind-blowing religious mm. experience because most of my students are STEM students. And I wanted them to see that being smart and scientific doesn't mean you, you can't have a religious experience. So I wanted to break down their categories. Yeah. And so I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And I think that the future of the SBNR and the future of the comparative study of religion, I think, are linked. And I think we will see a renaissance in, compar in comparison in the, in the near future, not because it's the only way, but because our students are, are just there. They're just there in a way that they weren't you know, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Bob, do you want to add something? Or? Yep, press that. Okay, yeah. stretch in there. Or you can't think, or you can't ask religious questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question. I have an answer. We go, Bob. You know. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It might have changed by generations. We were talking about one at the turn of century, a hundred years ago, called "In Tune with the Infinite," where, written by a New Age positive thinker. That the, to the deeper that you can open yourself inwardly to align with cosmic energy, you will become one, and the powers of, of the universe will flow through your life. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in when I went to college in the early seventies. 
the psychologist Abraham Maslow had studied people who are peak experiencers. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called Religion, Values, and Peak Experiencers, who said, and he, he made this argument that what's common to all world religions is a founding individual, a Jesus, a Muhammad, etc., who had a Buddha, who had had such an experience. But then when they go to communicate it, the localisms of time, place, mm -hmm. vocabulary get in. That book, I think, was the, the book uh, for the last. But then we've had books like The Secret in recent mm -hmm. years, The Road Less Traveled, the, um, yeah. the, the Celestine Prophecy. Um, so we've had a series of them, but they don't seem to be as long lasting. They mm -hmm. seem to have their um, 36 months on the bestseller right. list and disappear then as fast as right. uh, you can imagine. But I, anyway, I listed a few of the recent ones that surely I come across the most. Sure. So your question assumes people still read, <laughs> right? So that's the first thing I say. Um, the second thing, the text I use is actually happened right over here across the street. It's Ralph Waldo Emerson's Divinity School Address, 1838. Yeah. It's one of the finest expressions of this orientation I'm yeah. aware of. Uh, and it didn't go well for Ralph after he gave it. <laughs> no, it didn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> By the way, I've assigned that for class for Tuesday this coming week. <laughs> I don't think there's a, a scripture because that's antithetical to what the movement is. Yeah. But there are books that are passed around, and I, they, the people I interview do read, and they yeah. tell, oh, this is the best book. And I think the, um, the ethos is that you're on a spiritual path, and that the more progress the more you have progressed on the spiritual path, the more you know. And so th nothing is an end point. Nothing is, a, scripture is like a definite thing. And so it's always, well, this is the latest book. And so you'll see that a lot of the guru, not gurus really, but you know, Eckhart Tolle and people like that, they're always retooling their message in a new way. It seems like a new way. So the people say, oh, this is a new insight, new knowledge. And so there's an ongoing set of scriptures that don't last. But that's part of the ethos that goes with that's the whole a territory. Good, that's a great I personally think that's the study of religion. Mm. I think that's why you're here. Yeah. That's definitely why Michael's here. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a recommendation. Woody Allen movies. <laughs> have you tried those? Speak to you. Uh, I found I found there was a real sense of longing in many of my interviewees. And, and like I said, a feeling that they should, they have to move on. It was a duty to move on. That there was immaturity in adhering to traditional religious beliefs and that that was not good. They wanted to meet, be mature people. And then there was a sense of discomfort. I had the, the interviews broken up into four different types of groups. And the smallest group was what I called immigrants. Now they weren't immigrants as in came from another country, but they were immigrants as in uh, they got tired of not really having one thing, so they thought they'd try something for sure. Like say they tried to be Buddhist, or like I met them at Naropa in Boulder and they were trying to be Buddhist. But I found that it was a lot of discomfort, just like another a regular immigrant would have, like how do I adjust to this culture and I really not everything in it suits me. And there was a sense of, 
uh, guilt or inadequacy that they couldn't really buy the whole package. And I found that a lot. The, the immigrant group was a tiny group, small percentage, but I found that. So there was a sense, almost everybody had a sense that if I, if I really want to be a true seeker or a true mature person, I have to give up religion. So it was almost a duty thing. Um, and I thought that was really interesting about them. So I don't know where you're at, but okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, what I found was that they are, are politically liberal, socially liberal, progressive, all that stuff, and that was pretty clear cut across everybody. Um, were they, did they become SBNR because of politics? They were very unhappy about the politics. And of course, some of my, a lot of my interviewing was done during Obama, so, but they still knew about the rise of evangelicalism and their, and their politics. So, but they didn't really use that as their main reason for rejecting religion, which I was surprised at because we tend to think that they are, that they are using that. But um, it's certainly not helping now. Now it's adding to the SBNR population. But um, what I also found was that they, um, they, they aren't as, they do care about everything. They care about the environment, social action, they really care. So it's not like they don't care and they're just thinking about their personal growth. But they um, don't have the organization that, or, that organized religion has. And so they don't have a vehicle to act on this. And so they actually feel less, they feel, I think, more despair about the external situation. They may feel more optimistic about their own growth. But not, but they don't feel very hopeful about the larger picture, although they care about it a lot. And that's, I think, because they don't have the vehicles of organization, and they reject that too. So that makes it like a double bind. Well, a few things. The, the very first few quantitative types, polls and studies, definitely showed that the higher than average education and income and that they were tended to be more liberal than conservative in their political voting. But I agree with Linda that I don't think the politics drove the choice. But remember, stereotyping a group that now so many will tack that phrase onto identity, I think it's getting a little more difficult uh, to be sure. And you know, what do you, who qualifies as spiritual but not religious? And it is a map of, of a long spectrum of degrees of commitment to the spirituality. But at any rate, in the last few elections, we've seemed to see that if you only break down the voting uh, segment of America by religion, the Republicans have had as their largest religious category evangelical Protestants. Democrats have had nuns, <laughs> people who in some way have no religious affiliation, which may or may not include people who would answer none but be spiritual but not religious. It gets dicey there. But, but clearly Democrats uh, seem to have, that's more than Roman Catholic, you know, for example, that, that, the segment. So Democrats have their largest religious among nuns slash probably SBNR is my good guess of reading all that, whereas Republicans have evangelical Protestants. Oh, yeah. Wendy? Um, you talked about the stereotypes that, of course, one of them is a rich white lady, whatever. Yeah. What about race and class? Very and important. So, yeah, so um, <coughs> what do we know? Some of the. Or has that changed over time? Yeah, it's increasing. It's definitely in, the, in, the SBNR designation is really not limited to white people, certainly not to women, and I don't think to well off people. I found it everywhere, and which I think confounds a little bit of what you said, but I like to say often that I, I could take my out-of-work factory worker from rural Ohio and set him next to my fairly well-off yoga teacher in Boulder, Colorado, two places I really work and interviewed, and set them together, and boy, socioeconomically, they'd be quite different. 
but um, but theologically, as I call it, um, they would be really so they would find a lot to agree on. So um, I the st and the statistics show that more and more um, racial and ethnic minorities are going in this direction. I mean, you'd think Hispanics wouldn't, but they are. So I, I found less among African Americans at this point, but I found more among biracial people, which is maybe, you know, makes sense. But I think that st uh, surveys are showing that this, these groups, this ethos is, in, is emerging in all sorts of groups. Certainly men and women, I had no trouble finding men. It wasn't just rich white women in yo expensive yoga outfits. It really wasn't. <clears throat> I think we have time at least for two more questions. I've, I've seen two hands up, so why don't you start us off? Um, I guess uh, I think of one broad uh, <coughs> cultural trend, which is probably rooted in, in commerce and, and technology, which is that people have these expectations of, uh, of ever increasing personalization. I go to the, yeah, the right. market and there's like 25 <coughs> different brands of water, right. or I get my car and I get the color and the seats the stereo and, and, and everything. And so it sort of makes sense to me that SBNR would, would be consistent with that. Like, right. I mean, I should you know, pick my guy. You know? right. um, but uh, at the same time, uh, religion, I, th I think literally, I don't know the Latin, but I, I think it means to bind. And, mm. uh, and so, so one role of, of religion, of, of bringing people together, is, feels to me a little contrary to that. So I'm curious how you all think SBNR grapples with that that function, particularly given another technological trend, which is for all the communications, people are increasingly isolated from each other. Right. Uh, and so, so how do, how do we create a world where, where people who are authentically exploring their, their religion don't end up diminished because they don't yeah. communicate? Well, my just quick response would be, you're absolutely correct that I, I see nothing in the spiritual but not religious that, um, broad array of expressions of that that would bind people into yeah. intact communities. Right, so if that's your expectation, um, it, it, you because wouldn't look for is, that. It seems like that's a, a human need that's of value to the world. And uh, it's also a value to the world that people authentically explore their religion. But, but is there a way to allow the one without losing yeah. the other? Um, I don't know, but again, if that, that would be an expectation of something religious or spiritual, I would think it would be low, low in its capacity to do that. So I, I'm going to put my Eslin hat on here. I mean, that's my big concern right there. Um, you know, as, as someone whose responsibility is to help lead that institute, the executive director is always calling me or talking to me and basically wanting me to help him fashion a narrative for the next 50 years to bind this community. And I keep saying, Ben, I, I wrote a book about that. It's, you know, he says, yeah, but it's 400 pages long. <laughs> and, and he needs a two sentence you know, elevator speech or a four word you know, tagline uh, in, in today's world. Um, but I, I think that that's a real challenge because an SBNR community like that, and it is a community of about 150 people, and about 15,000 people come through there every year. Mm -hmm. So it's a real community, but it's a real question about how to create a narrative around which they can rally and, and be socially and politically effective. I think that's just a big question. And that might be the real Achilles heel of, of the movement. Okay. Yeah. But and I but I would say one one more thing you know so when I was when I was a kid growing up in Nebraska I grew up in a farming community and I grew up Roman Catholic and uh, I started to question the faith when I was in high school and my mom would always say uh, you know Jeff just just go to church you'll you'll meet a nice girl and you can get married and you know everything will be okay so she, and she's right about that actually statistically. Um, <laughs> and I didn't do that, you know, um, but, but that's a functionalist yeah. understanding of religion. And I think a lot of us are talking, asking questions in a functionalist mode. What will work? Mm -hmm. How can we be politically motivated? How can we form community? And I really think that Linda's right about this. Behind the SBNR orientation is a deeply philosophical, normative urge. I don't freaking care what works. I care what's true, you know? 
and they don't know what the truth is. But they know darn well that it's very unlikely any single religious community holds all of it. And that, that philosophical or normative impulse, I think, is what propels them into this kind of comparative search. And I think, frankly, it's the same search that a lot of academics are propelled by in the study of religion. And that's why I keep saying I, I think there is this connection that we don't quite understand between, between these two cultural phenomena. The things that are binding uh, SBNRs together are not are no longer institutions like they have been for other generations, but issues. So they will coalesce around various issues, but the problem is issues keep changing. Uh, you know, what's the critical issue of the day? That keeps changing. So um, I still worry that the anti-institutional bent uh, will make it difficult. But I think need will become, pop, could become so pressing that people will, will be willing to put aside that bent and organize. But I, I hate it to come to that where it's, you know, we're desperate. I'd rather be more positive reason. So we're going to take one more question. And then if, you, if you're among those who still have a question, forgive me that I have to conclude it. But you can ask our panelists personally. So, so in fact. I, um, I spoke to the Unitarian Universalist leadership at, in Portland a couple years ago at their general assembly, and they wanted to know, these should be our people. Why aren't they our people? And I went, you're right. They should be your people. But they're not your people, so we need to look deeper. And I think it's, again, the anti-organizational bent. They just didn't want to show up every mor you know, Sunday morning or whenever they would meet. Um, but, but politically, they're fine. I mean, progressive Christians can't understand why they're not, the SBNRs aren't flocking to them. Unitarian Universals can't understand it. In fact, everybody I speak to, and I speak to a wide range, says they should be our people if they only knew us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That seems silly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, not, not you, but I think Linda, Linda, Linda wrote the book that, ant that addresses your question. But this, I just this idea that all these liberal Christian denominations are saying, well, clearly we're the most attractive yeah, right. option for all these yeah. poor misguided SPNRs, and we will like that's the new mission field for liberal Christians. It Christian. is, oh, yeah. it is. But it's absurd. I mean, I just think that's that's not a sign of the death of liberal Christianity. I don't know what yeah. it is. <laughs> On that note, I think Whoa. we should end this. Uh, panel. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, anyway, that was good, clean fun. Um, <laughs> thank you all for uh, this wonderful, your, your individual contributions and, and these great questions. So again, we have some time to linger. If, if you have uh, more questions, uh, perhaps you three could just kind of hang out. But thank you.